Then Jesus says, said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. So I think Jesus revealed what it takes to be mindful of the things of God and not the things of men. If we're so concerned about ourselves all the time, we're not losing our life. You see the correlation? It's like I'm just seeing the pattern that Jesus was getting them, and we'll read more, but that he was saying, listen, this is, I want to bring you into this eternal thinking. I want to bring you into this, this spiritual arena that you know not of, but where you'll find the peace, the joy, the faith, the gentleness, the fruits of the Spirit, because in our own selves, we're not capable, right? John 15 says, without him, we can do nothing. So right after Jesus told Paul, you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man, then he says, it takes a taking up your cross. It takes a losing your life for my sake, and you will find it. And sometimes we still kind of, what? What? <laughs> but I think what reveals so much of whether we're losing our life or not is when we get in a trial. And if we're fearful or we worry or we lash out whatever the situation is. And that's one thing that he said, I'm going to jump over to, I want to go back to Luke 9, but I want to jump over to some of the things that he ministered to the disciples. He said in Matthew 6, 25, do not worry about eating and drinking. Your life is more than food. That was a little seed he planted. Listen, disciples, your life, I value more life, your life more than food. So don't worry. Even goes on to say, look at the flowers of the field, how I clothe them, and the birds of the air I provide for them. Don't worry about your own life. That's part of eternal thinking. It's going beyond that worry. It's going beyond that, ah, this isn't going to work. But it's eternal thinking. It's like, I'm your father. I see your life more valuable than food, than the flowers of the field and the birds of the air. Another thing he told the disciples in Matthew 10, 31, do not fear, for you of more, are of more value than many sparrows. In that verse, he says, your very hairs are numbered. He knows every itty-bitty thing about us. And it's interesting, he used hairs on our head. I mean, who cares how many hairs I have on my head? But he just wants us to know, that's how much I care. I know that much about you. Every thought that you think. In Psalm 139, it talks about when you rise up, when you sit down, I know you. I knew you when you were in the womb. I knew you. I formed you in your, in your, in your mother's inward, in the inward parts. I formed you when you were in your mother's womb. He places value on us. This is another, do not fear. I value you. This is another one. Okay, jump over that hurdle of fear. Disciples, believers of Jesus, pursuing him, jump over it. Because if you stay in that fear, you'll be as Peter who was mindful of the things of man and not mindful of the things of God. Are you with me? Okay, I, I want to be able to... Because sometimes when you feel like God's teaching you something and to express it to others, because you just feel some of it, so much of it here, but you want to express it because it's, it's being brewed in your heart. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm there by any means, but God brews in our heart. In fact, just a quick sideline, our, our son-in-law, Wes, we went out to get barista training. I don't know, Matthew and me, if you knew that, but... Um, 
But Wes's brother, who lives in New York, he said, they ought to have a little motto for their coffee house. What does Jesus brew? Oh, what would Jesus brew instead of what would Jesus do? Get it? Uh Anyway. (laughs) But he brews in our heart. He'll put a little thought or a scripture, and it goes, and then you just start. That's why it's so good to meditate on the word. Think on it. Pray over it. Sing it. There's so many ways that God wants to draw us closer to him. The other verse, getting the disciples out of their thinking was when he told him, when they told them in Matthew 26, 24 and 25, to lose your life, you'll gain it. I believe if we ask Holy Spirit, and this is part of abiding, if we ask Holy Spirit, teach me, what does this mean to lose my life? What does it mean that if I lose my life, I'll gain it? Or if I hold on to my life, I'll lose it. God wants us to jump those hurdles so we understand what he's telling us so we can walk the journey he's given us to walk in this life because he's chosen us to be a light in the midst of darkness. Amen? So I want to jump to uh, Luke 9, but there was a second, not just like a couple chapters over, where he again brought up his uh, death, his upcoming death on the cross, but I'm going to go to Luke's account. The account I read, Matthew 16, um, about Peter, you know, and saying, you know, no, that's not going to happen to you. That's in all the Gospels. I chose Matthew's. But Luke 9, 43, I'm going to start at. And again, my, the subtitle of my uh, Bible says, Jesus again predicts his death. So starting in verse 43 of Luke 9, he says, And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. He had just done some miracles. But while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand the saying, and it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. So Luke's account, as you read on, and I don't know how much you guys spend in the Gospels reading, but I would encourage you to. It's like just these little tidbits I've been reading in the Gospels. It's like, poop, you know, it just... God begins to open our eyes if we're hungry. That's really what it takes is hunger for his word. So it goes on to say right after um, Luke talks about when Jesus said, you know, I'm going to be betrayed. Then the next thing that happens, they start arguing about who's going to be the greatest, the disciples. I mean, Jesus said, what? You're going to be betrayed? What? And then they start arguing. I mean, they jump right over that hurdle of eternal thinking and go right into the things that were mindful of men, arguing, who's going to be the greatest? Maybe a dispute. I don't know, I kind of see sibling rivalry in my head, you know, when when my girls would argue. But Jesus' response was, you know what it was, that whoever receives in verse 48 of Luke 9, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and he whoever receives me receives him who sent me, for he who is least among you will be great. Again, jump that hurdle of who's the greatest. Jump over it. That's being mindful of the things of men. I think there's even a danger today in, in, in Christianity of exalting these awesome teachers and speakers and even musicians and groups. And Gary and I glean from you know, many teachers that we appreciate. But if we exalt them and idolize them, no, that's not good. And then you're down here going, I'm just a little peon. I don't know much. I wish I was like that person. That's being mindful of the things of men. And so in this, he's saying the greatest is the least. Look at those children in there. Jesus says they're greater. And so again, he's giving them this thought of let's, you know, he's just prodding their heart. Let's jump into eternal thinking. All right? So right after that, 
Verse 49 and 50. I don't think I told you these. I was, I was just going to run through them. 49 and 50. They saw someone casting out demons in Jesus' name, and they didn't know who it was. And they said, what are they doing? Who do they think they are? They're doing this. They're doing that. And it's like they were complaining. They were complaining that these people were casting out demons, but they did not follow the disciples and Jesus. And Jesus' reply in verse 50 was, do not for- forbid them. Forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. Again, okay, let's jump over that hurdle of being mindful of things of men. What are you complaining about? (laughs) Let's go on. There's a couple more. In verse 51, this is when Jesus said he was steadfastly, he had set his face to go to Jerusalem. In verse 51. And he sent messengers before Jesus. Jesus did. And as they went, the messengers, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him because that's where he wanted to do the Last Supper with his disciples. And so Jesus had predicted his death, but this is something he had to do yet, have Passover with his disciples. Verse 53, so they went through Samaria, and then verse 53, they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they did not receive Jesus, okay, when they were going in their journey through Samaria. When James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? (laughs) You just wonder what Jesus was thinking. Of course, we're seeing it from a different perspective because we're not a disciple. Verse 55, but he turned and and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. (sighs) How human we can be. (laughs) Go figure. I guess it's because we're human. And that's why we are all on a process. We're all on a journey in process. But I believe that daily God wants to put eternity before us. Not not the eternity of, oh, I want to die, I want to go there, I can't wait till heaven. It's not that. It's just that love that supersedes mindful thinking. That humility that, that Phil shared, that humility that supersedes pride, that humility that supersedes, I'm better than you are, or thinking that, you don't even have to say it. He wants us to supersede. He wants us to go beyond. How do we do that? In him. We don't have that ability to have eternal thinking. We don't. That's why in John 15 he says, without me, you can do nothing. That's why that place of abiding is so important. So Jesus was so patient and so amazing to continue to plant those seeds. Listen, guys, this is eternal thinking. I'm sure there are women around too. Jesus really ministered to women and and they were part of his following. He said, listen, this is eternal thinking. I'm putting these seeds in your heart for you to lay hold of, to grow in. And, And even when Jesus left and the Holy Spirit was poured out, I really believe their eyes were opened huge. I mean, even when Jesus rose again and he came into the room and he blew his breath on them, and he said, peace be unto you. Some say that that's when they were actually born again, which very well could be. And then they were baptized in the Holy Spirit in the upper room. We know that. But Jesus was teaching them eternal thinking, the eternal ways. What does that look like? So I I already read the scriptures about, you know, don't worry Your life is more valuable than food. Don't fear. You are of more value than many sparrows. Be willing to lose your life. You will gain it. Those are things that we've got to talk to Holy Spirit about. God, help me with this. If you feel fear, if you feel worry, run to Jesus. Don't don't run away thinking, ah, I'm fearful, I'm worried. We're to go to him, to go to the throne of grace, to receive Mercy and grace to help in time of need. That's why he died for us, right? Eternity with him. 
So we're going to go to John 17, and we're going to park here for the last part of what I believe God put on my heart to share. John 17. I think the most important part of our eternal thinking, Jesus reveals in chapter 17, and I've all, I've said this many times, I, I encourage you to read John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 frequently, five chapters. That was his last sermon before he went to the cross. He revealed so much. He revealed the coming of the Holy Spirit, how he would be your teacher, your comforter, your guide, that he would help you, that he said, if you love me and obey me, I will manifest myself to you. You know the first time God manifested yourself, himself to me? I was sitting in a beanbag chair in my college dorm room. I was hungry for God. I had been born again, but I had never, that was, I encountered him when I was born again, but then I wanted more of God. And the first time I really experienced him in the word, I started reading 1 Peter where it says the word of God is not corruptible like earthly things, but is incorruptible. The blood of Jesus is incorruptible. And I just wept and wept and wept. We all need to encounter him individually. In fact, I told my kids when they were young, I said, you're not going to make it in heaven by your mama's apron strings. I'm not going to tie you on my apron and take you with me. We all have the dignity to choose. We all have the ability to say, God, I want you, and to encounter him. In fact, Sean Bowles, I was hearing one of his testimonies the other day. Yeah, he's a teacher and a prophetic voice <laughs> that I glean from. But he was ministering. He was over in Korea, in South Korea, and he was ministering to this one gal, I guess, who was like a very famous singer and that. But she had been born again, and she wanted to know more about God, but she was struggling. And she was reading the Bible, but she wanted to know more. She didn't feel the love of God and didn't think God loved her. And Sean Bowles was able to minister to her. She was, wasn't out in the public arena. She didn't want the following and people because people recognize her just like a famous singer. So he was able to go back and talk to her. And he w she was just sharing her struggle to Sean Bowles. And, and he said, I can't give you the love of God. None of us can give each other the love. Of, we, I mean, we can love one another, but for us to know the love of God deep in our heart, that where it's sustainable, we must encounter him. It must be a reality. Agreed? Spirit of wisdom and revelation. And so Sean Bowles asked this, this gal in South Korea, ask him, ask God if he loves you. I thought that was really interesting. Really interesting. Because she was already searching and hungry, and so she said, huh. Okay, and right there in front of him, she, she closed her eyes and she prayed, and she says, God, do you love me? And she started weeping and crying and sobbing. God met her and kept saying to her in her inner man, I love you, I love you, I love you. That's where it's at. That will sustain us through the storms, through the winds. That will catapult us over the mindful things of man. We need that in this hour. Our strength will not come from the horse, from the sword. You know, the Psalms talks about all that, the chariots. I mean, those aren't applicable today, but there's other things we can draw strength from or just comfort ourselves with this or that. He is our only comfort if we seek him. If we experience him, God, do you love me? I want to know. And we will know. Every day. I believe he wants to give us that encounter every day. So this is what John 17 says, and this is where we're going to dig deep. John 17, I'm going to start in verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven. And said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Verse 3, and this is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. 
That's eternal life, is to know him. Does Jesus worry about us? No. He says, catapult yourself over that worry and know me. I'm eternal. I am your divine keeper. I'm the one that will keep you from confusion and misunderstanding and offense from other people or bitterness. Jesus wants to catapult us over these things that hinder these blockages so we would know him and grow in that. It's a growth. I love this part where he says, verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Jesus realized he only did what he saw the Father do, right? And in his prayer, he said, I'm done. I finished the work here on earth. Now I'm going to give my life as a sacrifice so others can know me, can come into that place of relationship. Okay, we're going to go through the most, one of the most profound, awesome, wonderful scriptures in all of the word. We're going to jump to verse 24, 25, and 26 of John. We're going to park here. Yeah, John 17, and this is where we're going to end. These are the three longings of Jesus we're going to read about. And I was, I'm reading this, and I'm going to read a couple paragraphs out of this book. This is a textbook. <laughs> The Excellencies of Christ by Alan Hood. If you really want to go deep, this is literally, he teaches this class at IHOP. He's not at IHOP anymore, but um, he calls this in verse 24, the mission statement of Jesus. And I think it's really important we get this for our own personal growth. We need to know that Jesus desires it's not, oh, yeah, Jesus loves me. This I know, boy, the Bible tells me so. It goes way beyond. Because even growing up as a pastor's kid in the Lutheran church, I was very mindful of man, like Peter. I mean, I didn't rebuke Jesus, but I mean, it was, I, I was in the flesh. I had no desire to serve God, didn't want to serve God, rebelled, blah, 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 blah. So we can be stuck in that place of religion or that place of, of Christianity where we think we're okay, you know. I'm just, I'm just talking general, okay? I know you guys all know God and walk with him, but we can get stuck where we're not understanding the things of God. And it just, again, it's just a simple being hungry and saying thank you because he wants to reveal himself. So let's just read that first verse, verse 24 in John 17. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you have loved me before the foundation of the world. We'll just read it through once. O oh, righteous Father, verse 25, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. So that first desire... Or the longing of Jesus is revealed in verse 24. I desire that they, who's they? Yeah, we, that we, I desire that they, put your name in there. I desire that, that Willie also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am. There's no exclusive the exclusiveness to that scripture. He wants every one of us to be with him where he's at. Do you know that's why he gave his life, took the beating, walked this earth, became a worm when he's an exalted king, created the world to save us, to understand who we are, and what we go through. He says he had to go through every temptation like as we did, so he become that sympathetic high priest. He said, yes, I come, not to do my will but yours. I come in the volume of the book. That's what he said, to fulfill the word of God that he had for me. 
his coming, his death, burial, and resurrection are revealed all over the Old Covenant, all over the Old Testament. So now he says, this is his prayer in his last days before he went to the cross. Father, I desire that they, all of us, would be with him where he's at. That's his longing. The second is that we would behold his glory. What is his glory? I, I'm just, this was out of my uh, Greek lexicon. I'm just going to read you the meanings of glory. To behold my glory, to behold my honor, my praise, my dignity, my splendor, my brightness, my magnificence, my excellence, my preeminence, my grace, my excellence of Christ, my kingly majesty, my, the glorious condi condition of blessedness into which is appointed and promised that true Christians shall enter. The glory. He wants us to behold his glory. Are we jumping over being mindful of the things of this earth, the things of ourselves, and desire, God, I want to see your glory. It goes way beyond gold dust or anything else, and I'm not dissing that. I'm just saying it goes way beyond that, way beyond that. It's him. It's his glory. It's his manifest presence that brings life eternal, that brings the joy that we need, the, the deliverance, the peace, the safety. And it's not just for us either. It's just to behold his majesty that we're going to enjoy for eternity. To behold his glory. He wants us to behold his glory. He wants us to. He desires. We can put desire before every one of these three things. He desires that we would be with him where he's at. He desires that we would behold his glory. And that he desires that we would know the love of the Father. In the bottom of verse 26, that we would know the same love that the Father loved Jesus with. That we would know that. The love of the Father, the same love, look, the same love the Father had for Jesus. And Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do. I want, I'm making that my pursuit to know the love of the Father and say, Father, and then maybe that'll, you know, God will put in my thoughts, highlighting someone that maybe needs to be loved on. Yeah, they need loved on. And so when we're walking in the love of the Father, we're, catapulting ourselves under the things that are only mindful of man, only mindful of Jane, only mindful of, oh, what do I look like? Or, oh, what will they think of me if I go up to them and tell them Jesus loves them? Or, you know, we jump over that. We jump over those worries and fears. And then if we're walking in the love of the Father because he wants to reveal himself in the love of the Father, then we can be free to love others. Amen? We can be free to pursue unity with, in broken relationships. It says, pursue peace with all men in holiness, which out without no one will see the Lord. That's a big one. But we do that through and by the love of the Father. Yes. This is eternal life. So I want to read a paragraph, a couple paragraphs that Alan Hood wrote. He says, verse 24 through 26 display three very clear heart longings of Jesus that the church must know and understand. He desires that we be with him where he is, to behold his glory and love him like the Father loves him. In the hour before Golgotha, Jesus declares, Father, if I go to the cross, then let my bride walk in this. It is what I desire and what I am willing to die for. This is why Jesus died for us, that we would behold him, that, that we would be with him. Otherwise, sin cuts us off. Let her be with me where I am. Let her behold my glory and let her love me like you love me, Father. Nothing accelerates my heart in the grace of God more than coming into agreement with these longings of Jesus. As I study and pray these desires, incessant heart accusations concerning God's nature and ways lose their grip. 
lies concerning my created purposes, lose staying power as I become confident in God's yearning to be close to me. I find God's desires for, for me are greater than my dullness, and his ability to bring me into those desires and to change me by his glory is greater than my weakness. In this, my soul finds rest and my vision becomes clear. This is foundational. He wants us to know how much he loves us, how long his longing for us. His longing for us is way beyond what we can even understand with our thinking. But I believe as we give ourselves over to him and say, God, I want to see how much you love me. I want to see how much you want to be with me. I want to behold your glory. I believe that as we pursue him in that way and every day step into that relationship, we're called into fellowship with Jesus Christ by the Father. This is a setup, guys. It's a setup. He set it up. He never intended man to be separate from him. He loves us so deep. And if we don't know the depth of his love, he says, know me more, know me more, know me more. I want to be with you. I want to be with you. And if remind, we remind ourselves, it'll push away, and this is what Alan Hood is saying, it'll push away all those lies. Oh, I blew it. Oh, I'm not worthy. Oh, this is just not working. Or, oh, I'm bored. Or whatever. It's like, let's pursue him. He's already pursued us through his blood sacrifice. This is reality right here. The broken body and the blood. Oh, that God would give us a deeper revelation. Father of Jesus, broken body and his blood. So we say in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 58, Oh, death, where is your sting? Death has been eradicated. Yes, we have to walk through physical death, but that is not the end. And maybe some of us won't. I don't know when Jesus is going to come back. Right? He died on the cross, and he, he defeated death. He defeated death. He never wanted Adam and Eve to die, but he gave them the dignity to choose. He didn't want puppets, right? He didn't want puppets to you know, you're going to obey me, you're going to do this, you're going to submit, you're going to be humble, you're going to be loved, you know, you're going to love us. No, he gives us the dignity to choose, and that's our journey. So now he paid the price. He opened the doorway, and he said, would you walk through me? He's knocking on our door every day. Walk the door, walk through the door with me. I want to be with you. He longs for us. He longs for us. I can't emphasize that more. So in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, he says, Oh, death, this is Paul, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's his work. He did it. It's nothing that we've done. It's by grace we are saved, not of works. But yes, now that we believe, we want to do the works. We want to serve him. We want to love others. We want to. So I'm going to run in closing. I'm going to run through these. I didn't give Gary these scriptures because I just want to run through them. I, I love the book of Hebrews. My prayer for all of you is you love the word of God, that you eat it, that you drink it, that you sleep it, that you sing it, that you love the word of God. Let it be your meat and drink every day. It will sustain you, the living word, through the Holy Spirit, of course, right? It's his word. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. 
Hebrews says in Hebrews 1, 3, this is talking about who Jesus is. Jesus is the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. Jesus is the captain of our salvation, Hebrews 2.10. Hebrews 3.1, Jesus is our apostle and high priest. Hebrews 4.14, Jesus is the son of God. Hebrews 5.9, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation. Hebrews 6.20 says Jesus is our forerunner. Hebrews 7.25, Jesus is our intercessor. Hebrews 8.2, Jesus is the minister of the sanctuary. Hebrews 8.6, he is the mediator of a better covenant. Hebrews 12.2, he's the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12.13, he is the mediator of the new covenant. Hebrews 13.20, he is the shepherd of the sheep. And that's just Hebrews. He is our everything. He is the great potentate. He is the one that rules over all. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word that makes it so clear, your love, your purposes, your longings for us. And, Father, I ask that in each and every one of our hearts here, and our families' hearts, and those we're standing for, neighbors, relatives, whoever they may be, that, Father, you cause our hearts to see, our eyes to see, and our ears to hear what you are saying to us today. That we would know in a deeper way that you want us to be with you. That you want us to behold your glory. And that you want us to know the love of the Father. And that you are in us. Father, deepen that. Grant us that spirit of wisdom and revelation, God, to walk with you day by day. To have that eternal thinking that will cause us to be immovable, unshakable, steadfast, confident in you, and be fruitful in every good work. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name.